Poor infrastructure has plagued Nigeria's developmental progress for some time. Roads in particular have been earmarked as an area of concern. Keisha Gitari met with Nigeria's Minister of Works to get an update on what the federal government is doing to improve the sector. Well, the federal Minister of Works, we've come to the realization that government alone is not able to drive road development program in this country because about 95% of passenger and freight transport in Nigeria today is by road. So that brings a lot of pressure on the road. So the task of developing our road is an enormous one. So government resources alone is not able to do that. So now we're encouraging, or rather we are, we are pursuing the public-private partnership to drive road development program in our country. Yeah. What other projects are you working on now, currently? Right now, under the public-private partnership, we are working on the access road to Motola Mohammed International Airport in Lagos, which is like a gateway into the country. We are also working on the second Niger Bridge, and we are working on the bridge across uh, the River Niger in Nupenko. And very shortly, we also we also intend to start the dual, the expansion of the Enugu Potaiko dual carriageway, as well as the. Uh, Ilori, Jeba, Mokwa, Tegina, and Kaduna do a carriageway. So that at least we will have the major Tiri North South Arterial Road in Nigeria, the A1, the A2, and the A3, completely dualized, modernized, and expanded. Now, uh, in terms of roadworks, we have a lot of issues in terms of the type of vehicles that travel on the roads. Oftentimes we make new roads and then we have tankers and trailers drive on them and spoil them, I suppose, for the long run. What are you doing in terms of covering that? Are we having bridges and separate highways built for these type of vehicles? Uh, no, we, do, we, we certainly we do not have the resources to build different highways for uh, big trucks and all that. But what we are doing currently, we are engaging them so that we enforce the tonnage of our road because the roads are designed uh, for trucks that are not more than 60 tons. But today we have about 70, 72 tons truck driving on the road. We're engaging them to ensure that the tunnel requirement is enforced so that we will not have uh, damage on our road as frequent as we do have them now. Excellent. And finally, some of the projects you mentioned, some of the new uh, dual carriageways being built, how long before we can see the completion? No, some of them have a time frame of just 18 months, some 24 months, and the uh, I think the one with the farthest completion period is 48 months. That is the bridges across the River Niger. Still on macroeconomic issues, we took a look at current labor situations in other African countries. Samantha Loring caught up with Catherine Namuye, General Manager at the Youth Enterprise Development Fund, about the labor situation in Nairobi. Out of the total population that's unemployed, the youth form 40% of this. And uh, the total population of Kenya, the youth form... 32%, which comes to approximately 13 billion. So when you're talking of 40% uh, of 13 bil uh, million, that's quite a bit. It's, it's quite worrying right now, and of course uh, you represent uh, a body that is uh, that was started by government, the Youth Development Fund. It was founded in 2007. Uh, tell us so far what the focus of the, of the fund has been and what your ma major achievements have been in the past five years. Okay, um, uh, basically the, um, the function or the mandate of the fund is uh, to make sure we empower the young people and that's uh, between the ages of 18 to 35 years. As the fund, we have been able so far to give credit to young people to an amount of about 6 billion Kenya shillings in uh, the past one year. Apart from this, we also provide uh, business development services in terms of um, marketing and market linkages. We do for them uh, the capacity building. We also have commercial infrastructure. And also as a way for the government to address the issues that um, surround the young people in regards to unemployment, we have a program that we call the Youth, Enterprise, Youth Employment Scheme Abroad. This targets young people who are either skilled or unskilled for whom we can export labor. And uh, so far we've been able to have 6,000 young people migrate to other countries on labor migration. So also upskilling a local Kenyan so that they can go and work abroad. Uh, what about the fact that, as you say, there are a lot of challenges that the, the youth are facing right now. What are the biggest uh, concerns that the youth have with regards to upskilling themselves in order to be employable? 
basically there are three major areas. One being that uh, our curriculum so far has not matched what the job market has to offer. The other thing is uh, the complete lack of skills in some cases. And uh, the other bit will be that um, our young people have not gathered the in what you'd call enough education for them to be able to access the jobs in the market. And uh, apart from that, when you look at the business sense, it has been very difficult for young people to engage in enterprise, especially because they're not able to access, um, to access credit. And that's where the Youth Enterprise Development Fund comes in. Do you think that you've had success so far in terms of the fund that was started by government in order to, to help youth uh, and help make sure that youth get jobs? Do you think that the fund has been successful or there, have there been challenges in terms of implementing it? The fund has been successful. For the past five years, we have been out there. We've so far, we started off with one office, uh, the headquarters being in Nairobi, but uh, we've now opened regional offices. We have 10 regional offices across the country. We are bringing in uh, constituency officers and the county coordinators. This is in line with the constitution and they're trying to devolve our services down to the grassroots. Apart from this, we've been able to advance to about 150, over 150,000 youth have been able, and youth enterprises have been able to uh, benefit from the youth fund. In terms of uh, the challenges, is that uh, this is a government fund and we know the government has several priorities, which means whatever allocation the fund, the youth fund receives, will never be enough from government. A South African High Court has put e-tolling on hold. There are possible but disputed impacts on sovereign risk, the promised focus on infrastructure and indeed a strain on relations amongst members of the ruling political alliance. These were the words of independent political analyst Nick Bahrain. Like with many of these things, I suspect both of those are true. Um, South Africa has, according to Jacob Zuma's State of the Nation address and a range of government state of statements, South Africa is planning a uh, infrastructure rollout program that is going to be funded to the tune of one trillion rand over the next eight years, not all from government um, sources. And in fact, the funding model is importantly established by the e-tolling, the user phase pays fees um, of the e-tolling system. So having it um, um, thrown out by court, in, in court, but also the, the tensions around it in the lead up, um, raises a real question about um, how that program is going to be funded and I suppose in some people's mind how whether the program itself is going to happen It's important for a range of reasons. It's important for all the, the, the obvious reasons for South Africans But it's also important for fund managers who are taking bets on where to put their money in investment stocks that are going to uh, Benefit from 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 the growth of infrastructure or consumer stocks um, and it puts a, an, an, it's a very strong um, driver of the focus of, 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 of government budgeting, public finances, where the emphasis is, is going to be on consumption um, <laughs> or on investment. And the attempts by Pravin Gordon to move away from cons consumption towards um, investment spending is definitely affected Nick, by the decision in the North Gauteng High Court. Nick, I want to pick your brain a little bit here because sometimes, I mean, uh, the whole argument has really been cost, where people that are or organizations that are opposing this saying that it's going to be really heavy on the South African consumers, South African consumers themselves saying that it's going to be really heavy on them. And then the government saying, then, you know, we are going to have this huge deficit when it comes to where the money is going to come from to fund the infrastructure. But isn't the real issue the, here also been that the South African citizens or people living in this country feeling as though this was sort of like a top down decision and that people weren't consulted properly? I think it's correct to, to separate the two issues. Um, there is no question in my mind that Sanral, despite taking the thing to, to Ned Lack, um, and in fact Kasati declared a dispute at Ned Lack against this process, um, they didn't persuade the South African consumers in Gauteng, the ones who would be carrying the burden of this, um, that it was the right thing to do or that it was necessary. I mean, I personally think, I mean, these things are really complex, but I think the user pays um, and infrastructure is the most efficient way of allocating the resources. The guys who are driving on those roads should be the ones who are paying for them, rather than the general tax, um, and the, the general tax um, 
pile being used to fund it. And I think that was the model that they were exploring. And more importantly, the lenders lent on that basis. They assessed their risk of repayment on the basis of the e-tolling happening. So I think it's, it's an important precedent. And I think the, 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 the lenders are going to be saying, hang on, that um, um, the, the, the borrower is not reliable um, and the laws are not tightly in place. However, at the same time, the court ruling and the, it's, it, the responsiveness of the judge to public pressure um, and, and the, the kind of democracy at play in the whole process was a huge victory for South Africa. Um, uh, public opinion got the thing turned on its head. It's not always, public opinion is not always right. And obviously, I mean, sitting here in Cape Town, it might be I'm driven by this. Um, I don't think public opinion was right in this process. But I think in an arrogant way, without proper consultation, both Sunroll and government shoved this down the consumers, the users, throats in, 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 in Gauteng and got their comeuppance. I think it was personally the right thing to do. I think it's the right way to have proceeded. But they didn't sell it. They didn't win it in the minds of the people who are ultimately going to have to pay those costs. And they're high costs. There's no question about it. They're exceptionally high costs. Nick, what do you think Sunra or the government could have done differently to get the buy-in then? If people like you feel that the people that are living in Gauteng should pay for these tolls, what could have been done differently to get the buy-in? I'm not as absolute as saying, you know, I shouldn't pay, they should pay, they were using those roads. Um, it's not as absolute as that, I have to confess. Um, there is, you know, I get, I use roads that I don't have to toll, uh, or that are not tolled in the same way as those Gauteng roads, and so I have a, indirectly a benefit that they are going to lose. Um, but I, I think the most efficient for, form of, of, of allocating resources and of, of like these is to get the users to pay for them. Um, um, I think basically it was, it was partly a selling job, it was partly going to the consumers and persuading people that you now have a, you, you're going to have a beautiful road. Those roads are a nightmare to, 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 to drive on. Well, that's all for this edition of Africa This Week. Join us again next week for another roundup of the top stories in Africa.